The City of Red Bank Regular City Council meeting is called to order. Today is Tuesday, September 9th, 2014. It is 6 p.m. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. Reverend. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your new mercies that are renewed every morning. Lord, we just ask for wisdom and knowledge and understanding. We declare your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We bless this city and we bless the citizens of Riverbank. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yeah. Please be seated. Uh, before I start, I just want to welcome uh, Chris, you and your church, uh, Living Grace to uh, Riverbank. They opened up uh, on Sunday morning uh, with a grand opening. Thank you and welcome. Um, roll call, please. Council Member Janine Tucker. Here. Council Member Leanne Jones-Cruz. Here. Council Member Darlene Barbara Martinez. Here. Vice Mayor Ken C Cal Campbell. Here. Mayor Richard D. O'Brien. Here. Conflict of interest. Any council member or staff who has a direct conflict of interest on any scheduled agenda item is to be considered is to declare their conflict at this time. I have a conflict with um, item 3B. Item one, presentations consisting of items 1.1, which is acknowledged the 2014 Teacher of the Year nominees. Uh, I believe they're all in detention right now. We'll do this at another time. <laughs> and item 1.3, the update of Stanislaus Consolidated Fire Protection District Board of Directors activities by Riverbank Board Representative. Uh, she's unavailable to uh, uh, update us today, so that will not uh, proceed. So we'll start off with item 1.2. Acknowledge the Oakdale Shelter Pet Alliance for their participation and fundraising efforts at the 2014 Strut Your Mutt event. <laughs> <laughs> so if I can invite up the Pet Alliance, all of them. All over here, please. Before I read it and acknowledge, I want to tell you that these individuals dedicate not only their time but a lot of their lives into protecting um, the, the sheltered animals. Uh, they arrange for individuals to uh, uh, take unwanted pets to other states so they can be adopted, so they're not euthanized. They have the lowest euthanasia rate, uh, mostly, well, at least in the state, if not the nation. So I want to commend you on that. So in that, and that now is to recognize you as a certificate of accomplishment and appreciation Oak, uh, presented to Oakdale Shelter Pet Alliance. The Riverbank City Council has the pleasure of acknowledging the tireless dedication and contributions that OSPA gives to the homeless pets of Riverbank and to Oakdale. And this is signed today by the City Council. And again, I want to thank you each individually, you personally, so much, and collectively for all that you do. Thank you. And so since I, you shook my hand last, you now get to say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever accused me of not being able to say a few words. Sometimes I get stopped. Um, Thank you all for the support that Riverbank community gave us for Strut Your Mutt. Um, we gathered up over 30 individuals with their dogs and trekked over to San Francisco, the big city. Um, and we really showed those city slickers what mm -hmm. these little communities of Oakdale Riverbank can do. We were the top fundraising group. Um, against much bigger organizations with paid employees and million dollar budgets, etc. Um, we stomped them 
in the costume contest. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was absolutely no competition whatsoever. We did a <laughs> Western cowboy theme. Um, those of you who follow our Facebook page could see s some of the pictures. Um, where's Norma's nephew was carrying a sign which inspired her niece to do a senior project. And gosh, um, we now have over $20,000 that we've raised that's going to really help uh, continue the spay-neuter program that we have that's, um, we've now done over a thousand spay-neuters for those pet-owning families that cannot afford to normally get their pets fixed, which um, has partly influenced the drop in the intake rate at the shelter to about 20 percent less than it was a year, the year before. So we think we're making a difference and we hope to continue. And thank you everyone for recognizing us and our hard work. Thank you. Recognize each of your individuals. Oh, I'm Betsy Corwin. I'm the president. Um, whoa. <laughs> and, and go forth to my right is uh, the co-founder um, that started it originally. Sue Lamont, Donna Baker, and Debbie Scholes. And I, I just mm. wanted to say a, a quick thank you for um, you have to help. Go to the microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I wanted to say a quick thank you to the community too for participating in the You've Been Littered campaign, which was um, kind of a promotional event for Strut Your Mutt. And I don't have the final amount yet, but I, we raised over four hundred dollars for that for the three weeks that we did the littered campaign. So thank you. Yeah, no, it wasn't okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Item 1.3, uh, no, excuse me, item 1.4, informational presentation on the 2014 solid waste rate study. Members of City Council, Maricela Garcia will be providing an overview of um, the, the proposal for new waste collection and disposal rates. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, the intent of tonight's presentation is to release to the public and to make available uh, the rate study that was propo proposed on the uh, solid waste rates, um, particularly with option two, which was the option that was selected by the City Council uh, during a prior City Council meeting. And so we hope that with this information, uh, the public can make an informed decision uh, and they will do have the ability to uh, protest these rates um, via uh, a writing to the City Clerk or also at the um, October 28th public hearing. And so just to briefly uh, give you some information, the intent of the study is to make sure that the city is complying with um, the government code. Uh, the city is required to show that fees do not exceed the proportional cost of the service and that revenues received from the solid waste fees shall not be used for any other purpose other than for providing the service. Um, the study will provide residents with, this, with additional information regarding the proposed rates. And the study was performed by an independent consultant, Bartle Wells Associates. Um, and so they were able to give their assessment regarding the proposed rates. So a summary of the findings within the report um, is that the consultant finds that the proposed rates are in line with the cost of service and it is recommended that the City Council adopt option two as it would enhance current service while keeping the cost to the consumers. This particular recommendation will be made to you um, at the October 28th City Council meeting. So at this point in time, we are not requesting uh, any um, consideration from the City Council. Uh, the 
study also gave an evaluation of the rates and just to highlight some of the information included was that they used the San, Fr San Francisco Bay Area Consumer Price Index or CPI um, and so based on that CPI increase since 2006 the purchasing power um, of our rate at that point in time of $17.50 over the course of the past eight years has actually grown to $20.90. Um, and so when we compare that increase in the purchasing power based on the CPI, um, that $20.90, the proposed rate for our current program um, would actually be $20.70, which is lower than what the CPI would have allowed had we been um, doing CPI increases throughout the past eight years. Uh, with regards to commercial services, the inflationary increase there between 2006 and 2014 was actually of 19.4%. Uh, the request that Jilton has made to the City of Riverbank is a 5% increase in their commercial bin services. So that's just the comparison um, with regards to the potential increase that could have occurred over the past eight years. And then I'd just like to briefly summarize the tables. Um, so as our residents are going through the study, uh, they'll be able to um, distinguish what the tables are trying to tell them. Uh, the first table is just a summary of the current and proposed cost for our residential and small business customers. Uh, you may have noticed um, that we refer to some of them as non-residential. Those are for some of our smaller businesses that actually use um, the regular trash, 90 gallon trash bins instead of the commercial bins um, that are used by some of our larger uh, commercial customers. Um, table two is just a listing of the rate classes with their current and proposed rates um, so that the individual could call into the city and request their um, current rate class and be able to distinguish which rate would affect them. Uh, table three just gives an estimate of the annual revenues um, that we collect for Jilton and for the city under the current program. They then also prepared a table which shows what the estimated revenues would be under option two, uh, which was the option selected by the city council. Um, we're also given a table which actually compares our current rates for residential customers to other cities in the region. Uh, then a table that summarizes our discount program that's available not only here in the city of Riverbank, but also in other cities. So currently our discount program is available to seniors over the age of 60 with a monthly household income of no more than $1,400. And we also have that available for those that are permanently, permanently disabled um, with the same income, monthly income limit as well. And so that one is uh, irregardless of age, as long as they uh, show that they are permanently disabled. Um, the final table is a comparison of the proposed program and the rates for the residential customers um, to other cities within our region. And so our following steps through um, continuing with the Proposition 218 process is that we will hold a public hearing on October 28th, 2014 that will be held here at the City Council meeting at 6 o'clock p.m. At that point, we will have our rate consultants, Bartle Wells Associates, who will give a formal presentation of this report to the City Council and to the public, and will explain their methodology and what type of information they use to, to be able to um, substantiate their findings. Uh, at that point, we'll um, also have the opportunity for the public to comment and to present any pro uh, protests that they may have on the rates that are being proposed and the council may consider at that time the adoption of the rates or they may request a second meeting if need be. And so that is all for my presentation. Um, both myself and Kathleen Cleek are available for any phone calls that may be coming in from the public. Uh, I can be reached at 209-863-7110 and Kathleen is available at 863-7120 uh, to answer any questions that the public may have. Have you any, had any feedback at all? 
Uh, it's been interesting. The, most of the feedback we've had has been with regards to more information on the senior discount rate. Um, and once we've explained the added services that they would be receiving should the rate be adopted, uh, there's a lot of um, enthusiasm, particularly about the bulky item uh, pickup program, as we do have a lot of seniors who do not have uh, large vehicles available that would be able to <coughs> take that for them. So I haven't heard any negative feedback from the phone calls that we've received. I was out um, visiting some businesses in the downtown area the last two days, and I two of the re two of the businesses actually unsolicitedly said, "Oh, we just got the thing in the mail." They whipped out their brochure, and and we're talking about the rate increases, and and two of them specifically um, had very favorable things to say about it. Um, n although no one is excited about rate changes, they did say that it was manageable, and they thought it was a very appropriate thing, and they referred to it. So. Yes, and we do explain the process to all of our residents who call in, so you do have the opportunity to protest um, in writing uh, to the city clerk here at the city of Riverbank, and you can also pre uh, present your protest at that public hearing on October 28th. Any other comments, questions? Thank you very much. Item 2, public comment. No action can be taken. At this time, members of the public may comment on any item not appearing on the agenda and within the subject matter's jurisdiction of the City Council. Individual comments will be limited to a maximum of five minutes per person, and each person may speak once during this time. Time cannot be yielded to another person. Under state law, matters presented during the public comment period cannot be discussed or acted upon. For record purposes, state your name and City of Residence. Please make your comments to directly to the City Council. Do we have any public comments? Yes. Hello. My name is John Foley. I'm a resident of Ris Riverbank for 28 years. And I have a couple of things I'd like to talk to you about tonight. Uh, communication, customer service, individual rights, and water. First of all, communication and attitude are two big reasons for misunderstandings and bad relationships, both professionally and personally. I see that our water department and city hall both are in need of both of better communicating with our city residents as well as more sensitive attitude when dealing with them. I did a little research and found out that under California Utility Rules, Rule 8, Section 3, the utility will make a reasonable attempt to contact an adult person on a residential customer's premises by telephone or in person at least 24 hours prior to any disconnection of service, except that when telephone or personal contact cannot be established, the utility shall post in a conspicuous location at the premises a notice of continu discontinuance of service at least 48 hours prior to discontinuation. Rule 11, Section C, says that where service has been disconnected for non-payment of bills, the utility may charge $25 for reconnection during regular business hours and $40 for reconnection during other than business hours. I did not see anywhere where there was any authorization to collect the debt to turn someone's water off. Civil Code 5650 allows a late charge not to exceed 10% of the delinquent assessment or $10, whichever is greater. It seems to me that the city is not interested in the struggles that some of our good citizens are experiencing and are only interested in taking as much from them as legally possible and using civil code and utility rules as justification for squeezing every possible nickel out of them. Access to an adequate supply of healthful water is a basic necessity of human life. On September 25, 2012, Governor Jerry Brown signed into law Assembly Bill 685 to ensure universal access to clean water. This bill statutorily recognizes that every human being has the right to clean, affordable, and accessible water for human consumption, cooking, and sanitary purposes. Under AB 685, all relevant state agencies have an ongoing obligation to consider human rights to water in executing their policy, their budgetary, and programmatic duties. So I told you what I wanted to talk about communication, customer service, individual rights, and water. 
These are four things that are very important in all of our lives and should not be taken lightly. What I would like this city council to do is to review the policies that have been around for years and change them to better reflect the way our city cares about its citizens, to make the necessary changes that would prevent people from having their water turned off in the first place, to implement, implement a new policy immediately that ensures that people are informed that their water will be shut off, and to review and lower the fees that they have been charging. I can't think of another utility that charges a 10% late fee. Our water department shouldn't either, in my humble opinion. Thank you for giving me this time to speak to you tonight. I'm sure that now you are aware that changes need to be made that you will do so justly. I look forward to seeing what you do. Your voting public will be watching as well. Thank you. Is there any further public comment? Seeing none, we'll continue with the consent calendar, item 3A, waive readings. Item 3B, award bid for morale road pavement resurfacing and rehabilitation project and authorized execution of future change orders. Is there anyone wishing to pull the consent calendar? I know we have a um, conflict of interest on 3B. Anyone from the public wishing to pull any of the consent items? Say none, I bring it back for the council. I make a motion that we approve the consent calendar. A second. Do we need to take it individually or not? Okay. We have a first and a second on the consent calendar. Councilmember Barbara Martinez. Yes. Councilmember Jones Cruz. Yes. Councilmember Tucker. Yes. Vice Mayor Campbell. Yes. Mayor O'Brien. Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item 5-1, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Riverbank, California to establish, amend, or authorize fees for the 2014 Fall Winter City of Riverbank Recreation Program Parks and Facilities use. Um, Mayor, members of the City Council, um, Ms. Sue Fitzpatrick, our Director of Parks and Recreation, will provide an overview of the proposed fees. Mayor and members of the Council, the Fall Winter 2014 Recreation Program schedule is complete and we are presenting some fee adjustments to council for approval. And most of our fees are staying the same, or if we have free programs, that's all, all remaining the same, and those are all reflected in our activity guide and on our website. Um, the adjustments that we need to make mainly are from the increase in the minimum wage that bumped all of our um, part-time personnel um, salaries up. So um, since some, most of our programs now are designed to be self-sufficient, we had to make some adjustments. So one is the Halloween Hayride. The adult fee we adjusted from $7 to $10. Um, we re we're keeping the child fee the same. And really for that event, we've been doing it for um, I think 11 or 12 years. And this is the second time we've increased. So we haven't increased in about five years. So it was probably time to make a little bit of an adjustment. Uh, tot time um, is the other program we really didn't want to adjust, but because of the minimum wage increase, we needed to in order to keep it self-sufficient. So this is a four-week program that's normally $65, and now the proposed fee is $75. So it's basically a monthly fee. The next three programs, basketball skills, soccer league, and the tennis are newly designed programs. We haven't done these in the way that we are doing them now, so the proposed fee is a new fee. Um, for the basketball skills, it's a three-day um, skill kind of clinic type of uh, mini camp. Uh, the soccer league, we have about 80 soccer players who are ready to start. So um, that soccer league is, is ready to, to get off the ground, so that will be good. Um, and then the tennis is kind of a, a different um, program. We've done tennis before, but this is designed a little bit differently. So those are the only adjustments that we are proposing for council tonight. Any questions? Any comment from the public on item 5.1? Seeing none, I bring it back to the council. Make a motion that we approve item 5.1. I second it. We have a motion to approve and a second for item 5.1. I 
Councilmember Barbara Martinez? Yes. Councilmember Jones Cruz? Yes. Councilmember Tucker? Yes. Vice Mayor Campbell? Yes. Mayor O'Brien? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Item 5.2, the resolution of the City Council of the City of Riverbank, California, adopting a Community Development Block Grant Program Income PI Reuse Plan. Yes, Mayor, Member City Council, uh, Ms. Maricela Garcia, our Director of Finance, will be providing the overview um, and discussion regarding both items 5.2 and 5.3, which relate to our annual responsibilities related to our Community Development Block Grant Program. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, tonight we are presenting to you uh, the proposed uh, revision of our program income reuse plan as required by CDBG or the Community Development Block Grant. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, program income is um, any payments received of principal and interest on our housing rehabilitation loans, any payments of principal and interest on business loans, uh, payments of principal and interest, if applicable, on our first-time home buyers acquisition loans, and any interest that's earned on that program income pending its disposition or availability to our residents. Um, CDBG requires the adoption of a program income reuse plan for the future, future use of our program income. So just to highlight some of the changes that have been made, um, CDBG is now establishing only two revolving loan funds for our program income. In the past, when we used to receive program income, we would divide it into four different sections. It would go into our first-time home buyer, our housing rehabilitation, our business assistance, and our micro enterprise facilitation. The city council actually had the purview of setting the different percentages in which the funds would go into these different areas. Now CDBG is um, changing that regulation and is now requiring only two different pots of money, one for housing and one for economic development. And whenever there's a loan issued from the housing pot, it goes back into the housing pot. So it's no longer a split amongst the four different areas. Uh, the reuse plan updates also include uh, that program income must be used prior to requesting a draw of grant funds for any open contract. Uh, we will not be allowed to commit or set aside our program income to an active grant. In the past, we used to be able to do that. We could bank our program income for future years when we may not have an open grant. Unfortunately, we're required to use all of our program income up front prior to requesting any new grant funds. Um, when an entity does not have an open grant, then we can apply for a program income waiver so that we can use and bank those funds for future years. Um, in addition, should an entity decide to leave the CDBG program, uh, we have to return any program income to the state if there are no revolving loan funds that have been adopted. And so tonight's proposal is to adopt the two revolving loan funds, one for housing and one for economic development. So our recommendation tonight is that the City Council consider adopting a resolution which will approve the revised uh, program income reuse plan. Thank you. Any questions? Well, I do. Do we have, currently, do we have any money in our programs? Yes, currently we do have funds available in our programs, and so the uh, housing funds will go towards our first-time home buyer because that is the active grant that we have open, and we do still have funds available in the economic development loan um, funds. Uh, currently there's a balance there of only $13,000, but we hope to, to build that up within some future grants. Thank you. I have a question. Um, you mentioned that the PI couldn't be applied in certain ways there. Do you see that as an advantage or disadvantage compared to the old way? It's actually an advantage in that we no longer have to track so many pots of money and ensuring that each one received the appropriate percentage because on top of that you then had to allocate the interest in those proportionate percentages. It makes it easier to say we have monies in the housing uh, pot and that's where all the interest will go. Whatever money's in the economic development pot will receive its own interest. Um, so it's, it's really much easier to track. Thank you. Have they changed the guidelines on first-time home buyers and the, what can be uh, purchased? 
So that is the consideration that we're going to have for you for the next council meeting. Um, so we do have an agenda item. We were going to have those for you tonight. Um, we wanted to make a few more revisions, so we're asking that you consider um, setting that meeting for, for the next council meeting so that we can present those updated guidelines to you. With a smile on your face, it must be positive. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. That's we'll, what I was going to we'll ask. We will wait. Okay, uh, any public comment on item 5.2? Seeing no public comment, I'll bring it back to the council for action. I move that we adopt the resolution that has just been proposed in 5.2. In 5 I'll second. We have a motion to approve and a second on item 5.2. Councilmember Barbara Martinez? Yes. Councilmember Jones Cruz? Yes. Councilmember Tucker? Yes. Vice Mayor Campbell? Yes. Mayor O'Brien? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item 5.3, Resolution of the City Council of the City of Riverbank, California, to adopt the revised first-time home buyer and housing rehabilitation guidelines as required by the Community Development Block Grant Program. Uh, Mayor, members of the City Council, as Ms. Garcia just stated, um, it is our recommendation at this time that we open the public hearing and then continue the public hearing to the next meeting so some additional revisions can be made to this item. And so for, for purposes of procedure, could do that. What she's saying, we're pulling 5.3 uh, for next meeting. However, it is an agendized item, and any member of the public or from the City Council may uh, make comments on that yet to be presented presentation. Seeing none, we'll move to item 5. Mayor, for the record, we need to continue that to the next meeting. Uh, okay. All right, we will continue item 5.3. All right. Since it's public hearing. I'll make a motion. That's right. That we continue item 5.3 to the next meeting. And I second. We have a motion to continue item 5.3 to um, September 23rd 25. and a second, multiple seconds. <laughs> Councilmember Barbara Martinez? Yes. Councilmember Jones Cruz? Yes. Councilmember Tucker? Yes. Vice Mayor Campbell? Yes. Mayor O'Brien? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item 5.4, first reading and introduction by title only of an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Riverbank, California, amending, amending Title 5, Public Works, Chapter 50, Garbage, Section 50.10, Rates to be Charged of the City of Riverbank Code of Ordinances. Yes, and, and again, I, I'd like to introduce Ms. Maricela Garcia, our Director of Finance, to provide an overview of this item. Mayor and council members and for our public as well, I do want to clarify that our um, request tonight is not to amend any rates, so no rates will be affected with this proposed change. And so tonight our uh, proposal is to change um, some of the wording within our current, current ordinance, um, which actually states that any increases, increases or decreases in rates are to be set by ordinance. Uh, our proposed change is to have those set by resolution instead. And so our current process um, changes the timing for rates to be considered if adopted when they are affected. So that's the proposal, is to change that timing. Um, our current process actually takes about a 50 to 60 day um, process in order for new rates to become effective. And so that process there is that a public hearing notice of publication is placed in the newspaper at least 10 to 15 days prior to the public hearing. Uh, we then hold the first reading and introduction of the ordinance at a regular city council meeting. Um, a second reading, if um, the council so desires um, to move forward, is held and the adoption of an ordinance uh, 14 days after the first council meeting. Um, and that's depending on whether, uh, when the council meeting falls, sometimes we have that extra week in between, so it could actually be uh, an additional five to seven days there. Um, and then the effective date of the ordinance is actually 30 days after that adoption. So as you can see, uh, the process is a little bit cumbersome. Um, what we'd like to do is be able to streamline that and in order for rates also to be effective as soon as they're adopted rather than to have to wait the 30 days. 
And so our proposed process would decrease our timing to approximately 15 days. We would still be required to issue a public hearing notice of publication um, 10 to 15 days prior to the public hearing. Uh, the public hearing would still be held and would still give our residents the opportunity to come in and uh, make comments on the proposed rates. Um, and then our regular uh, and then the effective date of the resolution would actually be immediately following adoption. And so our recommendation tonight is that the City Council consider amending our current, current ordinance um, in order to allow for our uh, solid waste refuse rates to be set by resolution rather than by ordinance. Any comments or questions from the City Council? Question. So if someone uh, wanted to protest whatever it was that we were trying to do with the rate increase, would they have an opportunity with, within our 15-day time frame? or They would still have to do that. Um, any new increases, uh, so for example, the current increase uh, proposal that we have has to go through the Proposition 218 process. Um, the franchise agreement that we are considering would include an automatic inflator and so technically you would be um, still under your consideration for future years uh, be considering uh, future increases uh, based on that CPI inflator. Um, at that point in time this process would take effect um, so that our residents still receive the information, still have the opportunity to come in, um, but because it's already been allowed through that franchise agreement, um, you would consider them at a different level rather than a, a full-blown um, right study and Proposition 218 process. And so the only way that we would notify our residents would be through the newspaper or would there be other methods of notification? That would be the purview of the City Council if we were to propose that. We could, um, obviously we would be able to do mailers to our residents as we currently do, uh, take advantage of any website. Um, we're currently going through an upgrade so that might be a more efficient way to do that as well as our utility bill. And it would be a, a five year max with the inflator so it, at a minimum there'd be a new hearing after five years. The uh, Stanislaus County Board of Supervisors are looking at a shift in rate structure for tipping or for dumping, and that is based on population, not what you actually produce. So the R's would be increased almost automatically. Would that increase? How would that be handled? That has to come back as well. Question on the time span that you have there with the, 50, with the 15 days that uh, transcribe, would that be enough time to get out mailers to the public if we decided to do that? Uh, usually we wouldn't do it on the level that we've done it um, for this particular mailing where we're um, providing them with a lot of information because the rates are totally new. Um, we would still provide them with what the proposed rates are and what the increase is, uh, but it wouldn't be at the level that we currently have. So usually a postcard size or, or something that stands out um, would be sufficient to do that, and that's a lot easier to put together than, than a, a larger mailer. A briefer. Uh, Correct, yes. It okay. would be on a more brief. Uh... All right, thank you. Do we have any public comment on item 5.4? I just um, have a question, clarification on city policy. Not just on, on this one, because this is the first time I've seen it happen. To, I'm not saying it hasn't happened before, but um, in your last meeting on the 26th, you voted to hold this public hearing tonight for change it from ordinance resolution. The notice was published in Rear Bank News on the 27th, which is pu already published, um, being distributed on the 26th. The actual notice has to be submitted the Friday before, so the city actually submitted the, pub the notice for publication the week before you had the meeting. Is that city policy? I mean, I was told they have to do that because of the council schedule. But is that city policy that you submit your notice to the public hearing the week before you have the meeting to decide if you're going to have it or not? Because then you're paying your taxpayer money to pay it, and what if you decide something different that night? 
I just wanted you to clarify state policy. You're actually submitting in your notices to publish a public hearing the week before you even have the meeting to decide if you want it or not. Any further public comment? I'll bring it back. City Manager, do you want to respond? Yes, Mayor, members of the City Council, um, we don't have a formal policy in regards to notices. The law drives when we publish, the, the publication schedule drives when we have to make decisions about publishing. And, and those are calls that we make in, in light of if there's been previous council discussion on an item, uh, what the time frame is for getting something done. And so I did make the call to go ahead and publish that notice and that in the event that the council decided not to move forward with that, we would pull that. And as you can see, sometimes that happens. Um, so because we had discussed this prior to this, because we discussed the trash, the whole, the issues surrounding the waste disposal fees, um, the process last spring, um, I felt that in order to keep the process moving, it was worth the risk of, of putting it in the paper and then having to pull it back or cancel that public hearing. Um, in a different subject matter, I might have made a different decision. And, and that is, there is always a constant, you know, balance between uh, the schedule and, and the funds. And I felt that in this particular case, it was worth the, it was worth the risk of, of the funds. And, and again, if, if indeed if that had happened, we would have canceled the public hearing and, and that money would have been, would have been lost. Um, so it, that was my that was my decision. There's no formal policy on on the matter. Okay. Thank you. Is there any further discussion or recommendation from the city council on 5.6? 5.4. I need my glasses. <laughs> 5.4. I'll move that we accept item 5.4. I'll second it. We have a motion to approve and a second on item 5.4. Councilmember Barbara Martinez. Yes. Councilmember Jones Cruz. Yes. Councilmember Tucker. Yes. Vice Mayor Campbell. Yes. Mayor O'Brien. Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item 6.1, Community Facilities Districts. Yes, um, Mayor, members of the City Council, th this item uh, on the agenda at this point is essentially an information item and to provide an opportunity to ask questions and provide a conceptual overview of what community facility districts are. And so I, I just want to make it perfectly clear for, for those in the, in the audience, um, both in the television audience as well as the audience here, that this is an informational item and it has to do with community facilities districts uh, for maintenance of ongoing maintenance and new development. Um, any, anything that might be implemented in the future would be subject to uh, a number of, of council actions. And so I just, because the, the Modesto be uh, presented in such a way that it might be confusing, I wanted to clarify that at the top of the back. And Mr. Anderson will certainly clarify that as he goes forward as well. So Mr. Anderson, our, our consulting community development director will provide an overview of this subject. Mayor, members of the council, John Anderson, uh, Contract Community Development Director, I've been asked uh, as part of the team to present to you tonight um, what is kind of a, a brief, well, maybe not so brief, but a discussion of what a community facilities district is or what it, what it might consist of. And uh, for those at home and those in the audience, um, community facilities districts were, were created um, by a piece of legislation adopted by the state um, as a direct result of, of uh, the lack of funds to not only build infrastructure but also to maintain uh, services and a direct result um, of the lack of, lack of dollars after Prop 13. So there's a, there's a direct, direct relationship um, therein and, and primarily in an effort as it relates to new development to make sure that new development pays their fair share of the services that they demand on the cities. So historically, when we talk about landscape and lighting, you know, you've, you've acted on, you participated in discussions relative to landscape and lighting district assessments. And a lot of the newer projects in the crossroads and others, if you live or reside within those projects, you pay a special tax to pay for the maintenance of landscaping and lighting within your area. There's, there's a direct benefit, there's a direct relationship. We've also, with new development, created storm drainage maintenance districts 
those storm drainage maintenance districts, again, have a direct benefit for the services that are provided within those new areas. Now, City of Riverbank is not unlike any other city in the state of California. There's a lot of folks that are in existing communities, existing neighborhoods, um, that they receive these types of services, but they're not pay paying a special tax. Um, we're not proposing tonight, uh, nor are we proposing in the future, to create a special assessment district to uh, enable us to tax those folks that are already within our city. The idea is to try to deal with, or come up with a strategy, come up with a technique that allows for the city to collect dollars to compensate for the services that new development requires of it. So that's, so that's kind of the whole purpose and discussion. So CFDs um, or community facilities districts really have two, two parts. One part um, you may have heard a lot about um, back in, probably back in the early 90s, starting at least in Stanislaus County with the Salida developments, where there were capital infrastructure investments that were made in schools, roadway systems, et cetera, that benefited multiple jurisdictions. And there was a special tax placed on those properties to reimburse for those capital improvements and bonds were sold, et cetera. That's not what we're talking about tonight. What, what we're talking about in Riverbank is kind of a, a, a super maintenance district, if you will. You know, we've been, we've been told by the consultants that the city has used in the pa past, Wildan and Associates, that as we move forward, we'll see more of these super maintenance CFDs where we fold in landscape and lighting, storm drainage, uh, police protection, and if uh, and storm drain and if necessary roadway maintenance as a way to help um, uh, close the gap between the dollars that the city gets through property tax and sales revenue for the services that are demanded of it and with the new development as it comes through so that's that's what this whole discussion is really all about so in my, my slide, I've referenced water, wastewater systems, storm drain facilities, parks, recreationals, roads, governments. Generally, those are the types of things that you would see as part of a, a, part of a bonded CFD, which you've heard about. And there's been some foreclosure issues with that, especially after we've gone through the Great Recession. Um, and there's a whole big discussion ab about that, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a maintenance CFD for services only. So we're talking about maintenance possibly of roads, storm drain systems, street lights, parks, public landscape areas, and then manpower services for, for police. Could be expanded for fire, but the only way we could do it through fire is we'd have to create what they call a joint powers authority where you deal with not only the city of Riverbank but also the consolidated fire district because they would be they are the fire purveyor. So at this point, I think we're talking about just services related to the city of Riverbank. So um, this, this actually has a little bit of history even in this, in this city. Uh, back in 2006, when we had this big wave of new development projects, the council took specific action to mandate that any new development projects coming forward in, in the area called the Bruinville area, which is primarily the eastern part of the community of Riverbank would participate, would form and participate in a maintenance CFD for things including public safety. That's on the books. That will be an ongoing requirement for those developments in the Bruinville area. And the developers that we have talked with, worked with, are well aware that this is the case. Um, so it's no, it's no surprise to anybody. It affects new development. So what we're suggesting here is to combine, you know, landscape and lighting districts, any special storm drain maintenance districts, and any other special service needs as determined by the city council into a special district. And this helps us with a thing called um, special purpose. 
there's always this whole this whole relationship between the actual tax or assessment that's levied and the services that are provided. We certainly have to provide that linkage. We certainly have to be reasonable in the in the bottom line assessments, all of which has to be vetted out in the public hearing process. All of which, you know, the council and the public will have an uh, opportunity to participate in. And the idea, at least in the beginning, dealing with developers is that we'll be dealing with the landowners and not necessarily the future residents. But we've set it up such that the council has the authority to adjust the fee rate structure, you know, as things, as time passes and as the service demands change. So that's, that's our goal and that's our objective. So um, the way it starts is, you know, when you, uh, uh, have a project. So when you have a project entitlement, which might be a rezone, a development agreement, specific plan, and or any t other type of discretionary project, formation would begin when someone records a final map, when someone seeks a building permit, when someone is physically doing something to improve their property. Um, not necessarily a, a building modification or an expansion or addition to their home. The idea is that if you were to clear a piece of property and to map it or to develop it in a higher, in a, at a higher intensity, that would be the time where we would say, hey, look, we need you to be part of a CFD for these types of services that we've, that we've talked about. Um, and the formation, again, doesn't begin until final map. So quite frankly, I talked about 2006, the council making this position very well known. We haven't had any maps go to final map yet out in that Bruinville area, out in the East Riverbank area. We certainly are talking with a lot of developers that are kicking tires, so to speak, to develop their property. But at this point, they haven't um, requested that a map be recorded. So that's why we haven't you know, gone through the CFD formation process. We're ready. Um, we certainly met with consultants. We have kind of daylighted the process. We understand, you know, the time frame, et cetera, but we haven't, we haven't initiated it yet because we, quite frankly, don't have an applicant in front of us. So again, so we don't have anybody here yet, but we're waiting. Um, once a developer does request record a final map, then we're ready to assist in the process. We have met with Will Dan um, in Financial Services. We're, um, we think we know which direction we're going to take. But you know, even to engage in the professional services you know, of Wildan or others, we have to go through a formal RFP process, which has to be, again, vetted in the public, reviewed by the council, and then obviously a, a, a contract um, executed with the council to proceed. Um, so that's what this talks about. This talks about the RFP process, what it might, might uh, entail, and the fact that you know, we're going to be um, driving, we're going to be driving this vehicle, we're going to be driving the, driving the vehicle to create um, this CFD, which will be a maintenance CFD. Um, and then there's, there's always, you know, quite a bit of analysis, you know, when you look at, you know, uh, what goes into the physical rate in the end of the day. It's not unlike any other rates that you deal with. Um, you know, there has to be a direct relationship, direct relationship between the benefit received and the cost and the services. Um, there is, um, it, it talks about CFD formation and two-thirds approval of qualified electorates. Generally speaking, when we're dealing with new development, one of the conditions that we placed on them is they will be signing a waiver, and that's they're waiving their protest rights to annex. So, that's a, so that it becomes a condition of their entitlement. If they don't want the entitlement, then they don't have to participate, bottom line. And it only affects new development that's moving forward. Um, and then, obviously, the, the, there will be a rate and method of apportionment, which they call the RMA, which, again, establishes that relationship between the services provided and, and the tax rate methodology that the council is suggesting. Now, what's a little bit different with a CFD as opposed to a landscape lighting district or a storm drain maintenance district is that the RMA is set as a worst-case scenario. So we set the RMA at the worst-case rate and quite frankly, that's because of Prop 218. Once we get registered voters moving into these new development areas, we have to have the ability to raise the rates commensurate with the services that are necessary. Um, 
if we exceed the rates that are discussed in the RMA, then we have to go back out to a 218 vote. So the idea is to be very careful when we develop the RMA that we anticipate and consider all the services that will be required. Um, nine times out of ten, when you deal with these maintenance CFDs, the jurisdictions will never assess the maximum RMA rate. They're always a, per a percentage of it, but they have the ability to raise the rates, so again, to take care of the services that are necessary. And that's for new development. That's, I, mean, I don't know how else to emphasize it. It's new development only. Anyway, so that's that's kind of that. So it's so there's two different uh, to to summarize. There's two different kinds of CFDs. There's a bonded CFD, which they pledge the land, and that primarily goes towards infrastructure. We're not talking about that type of CFD. We're talking about a CFD that can can be created for the maintenance of common services, and we're talking about consolidating those services: landscape and lighting, storm drainage, police services. Um, 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 police services and um, possibly roads into a combined CFD, maintenance CFD that would be imposed only on new development. When we have the um, the road uh, money, we get road monies from different sources. Would that be um, taken into consideration when we're absolutely? I think you know that's you know in the end of the day we're going to be looking at numbers, right? And we need to look at what is something that's reasonable for those properties because we don't want to be unreasonable because then we put us in a competitive disadvantage with other jurisdictions. The other the other issue is you need to make sure that new development is paying their fair fair share towards services and it isn't a drain on the general fund. So what we have heard is that the roads that we have in this area in in Riverbanks and it's not unlike any other community the amount of dollars it takes to properly maintain those roadways we're not, there's not a revenue stream that, that, that replaces it 100%. So this is that funding gap that you would have to be able to go in and do the ro proper road maintenance, and especially in light of the dwindling revenues that you have for road maintenance. And that's adjusted, as you know, Mayor, on a year-to-year year basis. And there might be other funding sources that come in you know, from the feds of the state that help you with those maintenance. That's where your annual assessment levy, you know, and the review by council of those levies is very critical, trying to incorporate those other revenue sources that, quite frankly, you may not have known about at the time the original CFD was created. And one other comment towards um, police services. What's our contract right now cost? Um. The current amount in the budget is a little over $3 million. Maricela probably has the more exact figure in her name. 3.2, Maricela? Yeah. 3.2. So it would take an average household in the city of Riverbank, assuming that there are 6,500 houses just at the current main, it would be uh, $600 a household to maintain what we have. So I'm... I'm, I'm I agree that we need to do this for the new development. The disadvantage for a new development is that they still share the police that no one else is paying for outside. Yep. So, you know, police office, police services cost twice as much as as fire. Fire is 600, 269 a year. Um, you know. I know this is just information, and there's no action. I, I have to come to grips with that one portion of the bill. That is a large portion. You, you Lighting, know, landscape, and storm drains, hey, yes. Well. Roads, questionable, but that's as when the funding source. But for when you're doing police services separate, you know, it should be spread loaded. Well, the, rea the reality is, you know, that since Prop 13, we have a huge inequity in, in how we raise dollars. Um, and the reality is, you know, the folks that live in Riverbank all have the ability to enjoy the parks. Those parks are not exclusive to any one specific neighborhood. The police services that they enjoy are not exclusive to any one area. It's citywide. Um, it's just one of those one of those tools that 
you know, the cities in the state of California and counties for that matter have had to rely on to be able to supplement the revenues necessary to maintain the service levels. I mean, the City Series is a great example. I think they've gone through three CFD levels specifically on police, police services. And I think as it stands right now, they have one of the highest ratios of police officers to population because of that CFD assessment that they have placed on new development. And without it, they'd be, you know, probably in a worse position than, than, than City of Burbank is now. So it, it, is, uh, it is certainly something that we got to consider, certainly something we got we to take a look at and understand and, um, and, and choose, you know, is it 100% pass through, is it a percentage, you know, what, what is the proper level? And that's the decision that this council will have to make in the end of the day. Okay. Um, property, property taxes themselves, the revenue we generate from that provide for a certain amount of services. Correct. As well as maintenance of parks, as well as municipal services. So when we're doing this, we're going to have to balance what they're paying through plus you know, a small portion of not directly. Now, we can do it for a, a new uh, construction. Can that be applied citywide and say any brown or any infill as a participant? Well, I mean, the way, it, the way that it's structured, I mean, the CFD district boundaries itself can be fluid. I mean, it's not like a LAFCO boundary where it has to be continu contiguous. You know, there's, so there's not a contiguous provision of it. So if you have brown, the cannery property is an example. Cannery property could easily be added to the CFD that I'm, that I'm referring to and, and other brownfield properties as an obligation. Again, new development, not taking in you know existing neighborhoods. And I would just add that that would be subject to the vote of the property owners. It is not something that would be unilaterally decided by the by the, the council. There has there has to be a process, in, that involves the property owners. Don, I have a few questions, if sure. I may. Go right ahead. First of all, several people approached me from the bees article about Melrose districts today. Can you clarify what the difference is? between a Melrose district and the CDF district that we're talking about? Okay, now a Melrose district is a CFD district. They are, they are one and the same. Melo and Roos were two legislatures that worked together to get this bill passed that created the ability for the communities in the state of California to adopt a community facilities district, CFD. And they are one and the same. I know there's a lot of negative connotism with that word mellow ruse for various reasons. Likewise, if you increase this, this would be, it, I'm getting the impression it could fluctuate. One year it might be more, one year it might be less, or a five-year period more or less based upon the needs of it. Right. But it's going to be there as a forever thing, basically? That's the idea. Okay. And I understand that we have to raise money, but just like the mayor was saying, I have some concerns too. Would this, this will go on to the property taxes, most likely? Yes. Okay. And I, I understand, too, what happened with Prop 13, but I also am aware that this is also being done, and if we keep doing this to a point, we might as well drop Prop 13 and go back to the old way. Perfect example, school taxes are now, school bonds are now incorporated into property taxes, and I, I know that because I own several pieces of property in town, and my bills are quite higher with school taxes. And if we start doing this too, again, it's going to increase them, and all of a sudden it becomes a mute point, possibly, because in a way, we're just increasing property taxes to get the money, even though we're not saying it, we're putting it there. So I have some concerns about things like that, just like the mayor had some concerns about the equality of it. Keep, keep in mind that, you know, historically, this, the, the city of Riverbank has required new development to create landscaping lighting districts and has required new development to create storm water drainage maintenance districts. So those are two special assessments added to the property tax right. that we're currently managing on an annual basis. And what we're suggesting here is not a bonded CFD, but a maintenance CFD, certainly added to the property tax that folds in the landscape and lighting district obligation, the storm drainage maintenance obligation, adds in new opportunity to recoup revenues or, or create a revenue stream for police protection services 
and for roadway maintenance. So this is not the, the bonded. Two. This is not the bonded one where this is we not would, bonded. Um, you know, um, give up the developer's responsibility. This is not bonded. This is not. We're not using. We're not pledging land for capital infrastructure investments like they did in Salida and other areas. That's not what we're talking about. Okay. Another question I have. Uh, would this exclude having the developers per se do some of these things because it's being picked up by these taxes or in some of the new situations where the new construction was going on would the developers be paying a partial and then some of it be going as the continuation of it? Explain kind of how that would well, work. Um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a bonded CFD, or let me, or let me say this, in a, in a um, because, okay, there's a couple different CFDs that build infrastructure. It could either be a bonded CFD or a non-bonded CFD. Um, for example, the city of Modesto created some rather large CFDs across from the Kaiser Hospital on the other side of Dale Road. Those are structured not necessarily as a bonded CFD, but as a one-time payment due at time of final map, as an example. Um, you can act, you can mix, mix and match in that in that case. What we're suggesting is an annual assessment that would go on the property tax bill, but is paid for, you know, by new by the property owner. It could be the developer and or property an eventual property owner or both, depending on how long it takes them to build it out. There's not really because it's a service related item, there's not really an opportunity for the developer to come in and to satisfy a portion of it. See, sometimes you can, with a, with a, with a facility CFD, you can, you can pay, down, uh, pay down the rate, right? You can pay down the rate. In this case, no, it's, it goes on. It's so just like a landscape and lighting district assessment and just like a storm drainage maintenance district assessment. Okay, so in a sense, and this is a mellow ruse from based upon what you said, right? It is. It is a, a community Mello facilities Roos. district, which is a mellow ruse, and we're calling it a maintenance CFD or maintenance mellow ruse. Yes. Do you have any idea, or will you have in the near future, how much this might impact the average, say, situation on the, yes. the property tax? One, one, one of the calculations we're going to have to go through is to determine what's the rate, right? What's the, what's the RMA, the rate and method of apportionment, as a maximum tax? So we'll have to go through that and make those determinations. And that will be part of you know, a presentation to your council as to just where you want to take, you know, what criteria do you want to use, what factors do you want to include, and then what should that maximum rate be. My last question, when the increases or decreases are done, is that solely the, done by the city council, or is there input again from the public on that per se? Do they get to have some say in it per se besides just sitting there and saying, do they get to say, approve it or disapprove it of a certain percentage? The, the rates are set annually by your city council, okay, and the public will have an opportunity to participate in the process at that time. But it won't, unless we exceed the rates that are established as part of the rate and method of apportionment when the district is created, okay, we won't necessarily need to go through a 218 vote. That's the difference. I'm See, right now, if on a landscape allotted district, for example, or for a storm drain maintenance district, if the service demands exceed what we're physically charging in assessments, you know, then we have to go out to a 218 vote to everyone, every registered voter that gets the services. So a little more, a little more complicated. All right. My last question is: Are there any other alternatives? I know we need the funding. I understand that. Are there any other alternatives that are there besides this? Well, the, the other alternative, of course, is business as usual. Um, continue to form landscape and lighting districts and continue to form storm drainage maintenance districts and try to be creative in receiving grants and, and other things to help backfill the monetary obligations associated with providing police services. So by doing this, we'd be combining everything instead of into small pieces into one big group and be able right. to manage it better and That's right. do the services. That's better. right. Okay. That was Thank your you. third last question. <laughs> any other questions? I have one. Okay. Yes. The consulting services, um, do we have any ideas to how much they, 
they're charging? Well, here's here's the here's what we have talked about so far. Um, not knowing how many developers are going to be asking for a final map, which is the trigger to actually start the formation process. You know, and thinking that we may have two or three property owners wanting to do that, um, we have um, asked, not confirmed, but we had asked if it was it would be possible if the consultants could kind of theoretically act as the bank so then that, that formation cost of around ten to fifteen thousand dollars can be shared amongst multiple applications and not just one developer this is an application cost that would be paid for by new development not by the city not by the citizens of Riverbank the obligation is for new development to form to form the districts and ultimately get you know annexed to the district. There's a process. There's resolutions and ordinances and whatnot that this council will have to take take action on to form and to consider annexation to the district. It's fairly well regulated, believe me. So, anyway, so that's that's we that's the that's the process we think we're going to go through. But as I've described earlier, in order to meet our legal requirements, we have to go through an RFP process select the appropriate consulting firm that we'll work with, and then hopefully they will agree to similar type of terms. And is um, this process of the CDF, CFD? CFD. Okay. Is this something that, um, is something of the, like the new future of property assessments? Is this something that everyone is doing or? I think, I think what you'll, you'll hear um, is that, that is the, that's kind of the leading trend. Um, um, City of Ceres, I don't want to pick on any one jurisdiction, but they currently have landscape and lighting districts, storm drains, maintenance districts, but they also have a CFD for police protection services. And I think if you ask some of their leaders, Chris Vieira, the mayor, and others, you know, what they intend to do with new development that comes in, I suspect they'll probably try to fold those services into one umbrella CFD. From a management standpoint, it makes a lot more sense. Thank you, John. Thanks for your patience with educating. No problem. This is this, this is, is a big a topic, and it is a, it is a work. I guess it's kind of a presentation, work, work, um, shop kind of thing. Anyway, anyway, so that's that's what I got to say. There may be some questions from folks in the audience, right. and I'll be here. That's what I'm doing. Okay. This is a public meeting. Are there any comments from the public? My name is Edward Jones. I live at Mobile Home Park across O'Brien's Market. Uh, I pay taxes. I've been paying taxes to the city for a long time. Uh, I, I'm not too swift. I guess the age is creeping up on me in my brain. But it seems like he wants to uh, enlarge our tax. We're already paying for lighting, sewer. Am I getting this all wrong? But this is the way it looks to me. We're already paying for this. Uh, I don't know what the, what the organization is trying to do, but I'm not for it. It doesn't sound right to me because I'm already paying. Somebody buys a house in their t this town, they go pay just like we do. So I, I don't know what this new, this new system is. It doesn't sound right to me. I pay enough taxes now. And everything's taken care of. The city is running great. We're taking care of everything. Chief of police even about for that. There's no problems here. But you raise taxes, you're going to have problems. You're going to have conflicts and everything. That's all I have to say. Did one of the thing requirements for creation of CFD is a specific plan. You have a proposed specific plan for downtown, which includes a lot of existing buildings, a lot of existing residential neighborhoods. So if you put new development in one of those residential neighborhoods, and you want to put that new development in this CFD, what happens to the existing residential neighborhoods around this thing, those of us that are getting stuck in this plan? Are we going to be categorically exempt permanently from a CFD, or once they start developing 
around us? Are we going to get stuck in one? Are we going to be, how's it going to affect us? Any further comment? John Foley again. I'm a realtor, and I know in Patterson they have Melrose taxes over there, and it's really hurt their property values when the people tried to sell their houses. A lot of people lost a lot of money. I'm not for Melrose taxes, and it's my understanding, if I'm listening correctly, that it's not going to go away. The one in Patterson is a 30-year Melrose. And, that, and it's already been around for at least 10 years. So that's what that you can pay, actually pay your portion off and be done. This seems to me like this is going to be a forever tax. And I think that I like the piecemeal way better rather than have this come to our city. Thank you. Any further comment? Those are good questions. Um, from my understanding that unless you develop you won't be a part of it. So if you're outside a development area, you're not affected by it. The Melarus in Patterson is a, um, an infrastructure Melarus, not a maintenance Melarus. There's a total difference on that. You are in a lighting and landscaping district that's paying for your lighting and landscaping. That will never go away. That's a maintenance CFD. Right. Okay, uh, anyway, that's a light, uh, lighting landscaping district. The third one is that it's not a, going to raise taxes. It is going to maintain the tax structure that current residents in current locations are paying. It will go up depending upon what the value of the property is there in a, uh, if the county assessor decides to reassess property values. But it does not affect anyone else. It affects those that are coming in and are not a burden, but are placing additional um, stress on the existing infrastructure. Uh, I'm for the CFDs, but we're not here to vote. We're here just for information. This will be coming in in a lot more detail later on when we, if we start development. Developers won't develop if it's not advantageous to not only them, but to, to their uh, ability to sell properties and maintain those properties. So are there any other further comments or questions? Mayor, if I could just add one thing, and, and hopefully this will be helpful, is one way to describe this is me the Melarus Act authorizes the formation of the CFDs. And, and you articulated the different kinds of CFDs that are available under that act. I, I think because of, of some of the publicity given in the past, and when you say Melarus, people automatically think about the bonded infrastructure ones. They're not as familiar with the maintenance CFDs, which is what we're focused on. So it, one way in communicating this um, to, to the public for all of us is that it's authorized by that, but there are different kinds of taxes that are authorized, or Melarus districts that are authorized. So, um, and, and again, just to reiterate your point, is that what we're talking about is a maintenance. So it's a, a way to generate income to, that is that is directly related to the services being provided to the properties that are being affected by the district. And the money raised can essentially only be used to provide services to those properties paying. Right, and, and this city council will also take a look at how are some of the other funding that's available out there, such as property taxes currently, the level of property taxes maintaining uh, X amount of roads, X amount of parks, X, X, anything above and beyond that should become the lighting, landscaping, stormwater, or in this case, the maintenance CFD. So with that, um, before I go to item seven, I'm going to go to item eight, which is the closed session. The closed session is not going to happen tonight, but I have to read it anyway. Item 8.1, Conference with Legal Counsel Existing Litigation Pursuant to Government Code 54956.9 Alpha. Name of case, 
Adria Allen and Francis, Francis Allen versus City of Riverbank, Stanislaus County Superior Court, case number 670739. Is there anyone wishing to make comments on this? Seeing none, we will not be uh, reporting out of closed session, and now we'll continue on with the comments. Uh, item 7.1, staff comments. Yes, a mayor member of the city council would like to start out tonight with Kathleen Cleek, who will provide an overview on the project that was approved earlier this evening, which is the ADA improvements on Morrell Road and Overlay. Good evening, mayor and members of the city council. Um, tonight you approved a bid for a project on Morrell Road. Um, the project is going to consist of uh, road improvements, curb, gutter, sidewalk, and some ADA improvements. Um, it's going to go from Jackson to 200 feet west of Roselle. So um, it's going to be happening beginning in October, and it'll be about 45 days. Um, there'll be some traffic controls in place, and we will make sure that the um, information gets out to the public. Um, especially the homeowners who live around that area, and also um, update our website um, so that the public knows um, exactly what's going on and what process we're in. So I just wanted to give you that update. Thank you. And Sue Fitzpatrick. Those who may have not heard otherwise is our Director of Parks and Recreation. Yeah, members of the council, a couple things coming up in the next few weeks. Um, we have Teen Fest at the Teen Center kind of concentrating on the teens in September. Um, that'll be uh, September 20th from 2 to 5 at the Teen Center. We're going to have spec ops out there with uh, uh, marshmallow uh, arrows and bow and arrow uh, games. And then we're also going to have um, where the, the teens get into these plastic bubbles and they, they do these games. So it's going to be pretty neat. So if you want to stop by anyone and, and join that, that's... That's going to be fun. Um, other than that, the next weekend, September 27th, we're taking 15 to 20 te teens um, horseback riding at Kennedy Meadows. So um, that'll be what we're working on in the next. Do you need anyone to go along with you? We do. <laughs> <laughs> we do. <laughs> so. What was the date of the Teen Fest? Teen Fest is September 20th from 2 to 5. And then the horseback riding is September 27th. Okay, thank you. And um, I would just like to thank the staff as well for the, the work that they do. Uh, I don't often do that, but I think tonight you can see that the, the wide range of things that they're dealing with, and um, particularly in light of the fact that I was at the League of California Cities Conference, um, it's always nice to know you're leaving things in, ca in capable hands. And so with that, I, for the public's benefit, I'd like to acknowledge the commitment of this council. All five of you took time away from your your, your jobs, your families to come and participate in the annual League of California Cities Conference that had just um, a lot of good information, a lot of people, a lot of, of information about products and an opportunity to discuss issues that are impacting the state of California and the cities uh, that we all serve. And so um, being there with all of you just it was a, a very positive experience for me. Got a lot of good information, and I think that we were able to, uh, in many cases, uh, cover most of the most of the sessions that were being offered between the six of us. So I would like to just thank you for that opportunity and thank you for your commitment to the city uh, that you demonstrate day in and day out, and, and in particular by taking time away uh, for days at a time to better represent the community. <laughs> Uh, council um, comments, starting with Council Member Leanne Cruz. Thank you. Um, I just have one comment tonight, and it's with regards to the League of California Cities Conference. I think one of the things that I left with that um, kind of the main thing, there were a lot of really good sessions that were uh, that I attended, but the one thing I wanted to just kind of share tonight was I attended one uh, that was put on by the city of Rancho Cordova. And they had uh, what they called the um, community council. And this was basically their, uh, all of their nonprofit groups and their faith-based groups that got together. And 
they were the ones that were, it was like having all of these small nonprofit groups getting together and becoming one cohesive group to put on city events. And they, they talked about, and I know we've had some uh, a large participation with the faith-based groups and nonprofit groups, but they, they kind of organized them in a way, and so I would encourage the council to go and take a look at the model that Rancho Cordova put together. It was um, pretty impressive, and I think if that's one thing I want to bring back to the council, that I think that might be something that would really benefit our city is to look at this community council and the way they put it together. They were actually in the nonprofit group that kind of took all the nonprofit groups together and and talked about being, you know, we've got so many small groups and how powerful it was to combine them and have one big group that was able to work together. Um, so I'd encourage you to take a look at some of that stuff. Thank you. Council Member Barbara Martinez. Um, I, too, enjoyed the League of California Cities Conference, and the educational sessions that I attended helped me to plan for the present and also the future of our community. And I also want to congratulate the Church of Living Grace and their new location. Uh, tomorrow is the last day for the Farmer's Market and our family night out events for this season. And uh, our Chamber of Commerce looks forward to serving our community next year. And a reminder that the Scott Pettit Blues and Bibs event presented by the Riverbank Chamber of Commerce is this Saturday, September the 13th, from 4 to 8 at the Community Center. Thank you. Council Member Tucker. Um, I just wanted to, to say thank you to the city for giving all of us the opportunity to attend the League of California uh, Cities Conference. Um, and to, and to help us with our expenses so that we could attend. And I really feel that it was uh, very helpful, very beneficial. The information uh, that we got was, um, it was very enlightening, very informative. Um, and, and we took a lot of great ideas away that, that you know, we've, some of us have discussed these ideas with the city uh, manager already. And we're excited uh, and enthusiastic and re reinvigorated in our, in our quest to improve the city and uh, bring uh, great ideas and innovations to our city. So uh, I just wanted to appreciate and thank uh, Ms. Anderson and, and the city for allowing us to, to do that um, and supporting us in that effort. I also wanted to... Uh, uh, encourage everyone to attend the Scott Pettit uh, Blues and Bibs uh, on uh, on Saturday. And finally, I just wanted to um, just make note of the fact that with this uh, situation that we have in the news right now with, with Mr. Rice and the domestic violence situation that's um, currently bringing domestic violence into the forefront again, and it's certainly something that we all need to... Um, you know, take care of one another. Watch, you know, watch our neighbors. Um, a lot of times domestic violence happens behind closed doors, but you see the people with the bruises, you see the people with the black eyes, you see the people with the fat lips. Whether they're male or female, whether they're rich or poor, it happens in every segment of our society. And we need to encourage and help people to get out of the f situations that they're in. They f often feel stuck in those situations, like there is no hope, there is no way to get out, but there is help. And we need to um, help them to help themselves to get out of their situations. And we also need to help our perpetrators. And I know that um, I often work with prosecutors, and that's, and that's a difficult concept for some of them, because they deal with the victims of, of this horrible um, plague on our society every day. But we also have to help our perpetrators because it is often, uh, is, as they say, it is the cycle of violence. And the perpetrators are, um, are often victims themselves from, from pa the past. So anyway, just uh, something to be, to be aware of in our neighborhoods. Help our, help our neighbors. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I agree with everything that's been said by my previous council members that have spoken. And I'm just going to go to one last item. Riverbank Christian Food Sharing, which is one of our older nonprofits that does a great job of getting food to the needy. They've been doing it for well over 25 years. They really need your help. Their truck broke down and they're having a spaghetti dinner. They have to fix their transmission. This is one of their major fundraisers. And it's going to be on Saturday, September 20th, 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the community center. Price is $7 for adults and 
children under 12, $4. At, again, at the Riverbank Community Center, there will be a raffle. So even if you can't attend it, if you want to donate a raffle price to them, you can call down here at City Hall. They'll tell you a number to get a hold of someone. But they really need your help because I know they need a transmission replaced on that truck so they can keep delivering. Hope you can make it. Thank you. Uh, several items tonight I'd like the council to just think about um, different methodologies or methods to input into our uh, public discussion when we ask for public comment or we ask for uh, discussion on items if people cannot make it what is a good way of getting that information uh, to us and can we accept different forms whether it's written or telephonic or some other type of inputs. I'd like so like like to know about the legality of that uh, from the, our uh, city attorney, because I think an email or a letter uh, sent in uh, could be part of our public record. Second thing, I I know it met either with resounding exuberance, but I got a lot of deafening silence. If we go away on doing city's business, I think we should do some type of a trip report, what we have done, you know, wh how it benefits the city. So we have a permanent record of what we've done and possible takeaways that can help improve um, the, um, our communications um, and also our abilities to, to deliver services. We are a heal city, that is healthy, eating, active lifestyle. And um, I'd like to have the city council take a look at our downtown beautification district that we have. We have areas of it where there is no smoking allowed, but there's others that can smoke anywhere um, or they uh, feel like they can. I'd like to take a, a revisit our smoking ordinance to include areas. I know parks, I believe parks are, you can't smoke at parks. I know that we passed an ordinance on it, but it's just the enforcement on it. Yeah, basically right now what we have is within 20 feet of the buildings and then within, I think it's 20 feet of the playground. That's right. Yeah. And the, the skate park has no smoking, so it depends on the park. I I'd think. like to revisit our, our smoking ordinance to include e-cigarettes as well as, you know, part of our park system to go in line with our healthy eating active lifestyle. And there's more to that going on down. I want to do certain projects that will help include kids during the summer, get them out of their homes and into active lifestyles. But that's a different program with different entities. And I'll be taking that up myself. And my last item is probably the most important one. Happy birthday tomorrow. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome. Appreciate that. Okay, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.